Welcome to Venice Designs. This is a live stream with live people and a live recorded for Ustream.tv and also for YouTube for people to watch at their leisure. And I wanted to go through the colour theory. I've seen lots of videos um, and I was a bit, a bit, not disgruntled, but as uh, Mr. Mr. Dodd, Sir Dodd would say, but I was always wary about saying things because I can't remember certain things and I'm always, you've got to be pretty accurate if you're going to say something. But I had a general idea um, that I found out, I dug out some old art books uh, that I bought for my degree um, about four or five years ago. And so I thought I'd go through what the books say um, and reiterate what I've done in the past. So you're getting confirmation of what I've done it is, it is a pretty accurate description of colour mixing. So um, it's not the blind leading the blind kind of thing. So in the colour book, I always talk about the colour wheel. Um, so you've got a primary set of colours and this is what I use the colour wheel for, for the printing inks. And I made 600 and some, just over 630 some, uh, in one of the videos by using printer inks because I thought if the printer ink, the printer can do it, I can do it. And I've always thought this, but you always have a little bit of difficulty. So I bought three Cotman tubes of student grade paints. I brought a lemon yellow and a Lithium crimson, which is a pinky red very similar to magenta which you use in the printer and a cerulean blue which is a cold sky blue very pale blue cold blue very vivid like the cyan in the printer inks and the lemon yellow which is a very cold bright yellow very much like the vivid yellow on the printer so we have these colors and they're fab and in my color wheel i made lots and lots of colors and i think in one of the books in my Kirby Roseanne Imagimorphia, I'm just going to actually put the camera up very slightly um, and then I'll, in this book here was the first, I can see if I'm in focus, just bear me two seconds and I'll rejiggle the focus thing um, it should be about right, just bear with me two seconds I also bought this book as well, which is about the old fashioned proper master's way of, of colouring. Now things have changed. I think that's quite good that just put me two seconds. I think that's about as good as we're going to get. So in this book here. I made a colour chart and a colour wheel um, in a little plastic pound, um, a little palette, with a plastic palette that I had to because I can't get to it just at the moment. The colours are still there, they've dried but they're still there. And I made all these colours from that particular palette and I loved it. But the only thing is I couldn't get a vivid purple, I got this kind of it's a nice purple it's a tertiary color what i would call it's it's um, a ready and a, and a and a dull purple because i didn't have the bright colors so you can actually get quite a lot of colors with three colors and they were on offer for 99p and i did quite a lot of work with those three tubes of cotman um winsor newton cotman student grade but i love this so I went out and I bought six colours. Um, that's the same palette, but the colours were getting fainter. And I think I started another one. But then I decided I actually like professional watercolours and I bought six. Now you can hunt round and get them in a set. Now the sets I don't particularly like because there's always one colour missing. And I don't like greens. I like mixing my own greens. So all these colours are from six colours. There's a cold yellow, a warm yellow, a cold red, a warm red, 
a cold blue and a warm blue. And those six colours will give you any colour on the rainbow. So we go back to the colour book. The colour book says the primary triad form forms an equilateral triangle on the spectrum. So this is basically a colour wheel. I'll zoom in a bit. You can see. And then I'll just jiggle that a little bit. There. Oops. Go and go away. Right. So what that means is that's the lemon yellow, that's the selenium blue, and that's the lilium crimson, which made all these colours. In fact, see if I can just, I'll leave you with that for just a second. Just see if I can actually physically get to that. and de-stashing all my art supplies and so things have got kind of piled up so basically oops, 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 I'll lift that up a little bit this was my original colour wheel that I made from three Elysian Crimson colours sorry about that <clears throat> and then I painted this so I had a cerulean blue, which was very cold. <coughs> oh, do it, excuse me. I just need to zoom out a little bit. So I started with the cold blue, the Liz and Crimson, the lemon yellow, which doesn't look like a lemon yellow now, but it was, and the Elysian Crimson, which is a very, very warm pinky red. Um, now they have different names for different companies, but we'll just call it a pinky red, a very cold, cool blue, very vivid blue, and the lemon. If you think about these three colours as the printer ink colours, very vibrant but cold. Oh, sorry, but apart from the red, which is, is very, very pinky, so that's warm, sorry. So I could not get the cadmium red that I wanted. I had to mix the cold yellow with the cold red to make an orange. And obviously I had more yellow and just a touch of the red because it's very vibrant. That gave me an orange. So then I took some more yellow, cold yellow, and put just a touch of orange to it to make a cadmium yellow, a warm yellow. I took some more Elysian crimson and put a touch of orange to it to make a cadmium red. So I have a cooler red, a pinky red, an orange, a yellow, and the bright yellow. So then I took the Elysian Crimson and the Selenium Blue, and I made a purple. And from the purple, I put a touch into the cold blue to make a, a, a French ultramarine, but it was a very poor one, and I'll tell you why in a second. It's the only one that didn't work. So then we take the bright blue and the bright yellow and we make a bright green, a very, very vivid pea bright green. 
I then took a tiny amount of the green and a touch of the cold yellow to make a kind of um, a lemony green. So almost a, a very pale lemony, either nearly yellow or nearly green. So very pale green. On the other colour wheel, I would then take a little bit of the bright green with a touch of the cold blue and I would make a darker green. So I would have three greens. So then I took the purple, um, as I said, this was very poor. So that gave me my three primary colours made six colours. Let me show it on here. It gave me six colours. But the problem was, the purple wasn't the beautiful, bright, vivid purples that we like. So I said, right, we really need to buy six colours. You only need six colours, but you can get away with, with some beautiful effects, three colours. This was just three colours, and they were 99p each, and I got some beautiful shades of mixing my colours. And if you notice on the palette, they're all kind of mixed together and... It's a real, real mishmash of colour, but that's still beautiful, pure. It's not professional watercolours, but it's it's good enough for me and my colour books. And that's why I have never washed it out, because I really loved these greens. I will never make again because they're on here. They're very difficult to match. So I love this colour page. It's one of my favourites. And it was made by Cheap Cotman watercolour tubed paints from three colours costing me less than three pounds so because of that I made a video called colour mixing which had three printer inks I used the printer inks and I ended up with 600 colours the only difficulty was the French ultramarine that beautiful warm blue that makes everything kind of sing I could still get my beautiful pale blues, but I couldn't get my lovely purples. So that's why I bought the six colours. And this was my first attempt to play, and there is a video of how I mixed the colours. And again, the favourite thing of mine was I wanted the toadstools um, to not be too pinky red or too cold yellow, uh, red. So I mixed equal numbers of azillion crimson, equal amount, sorry, of azillion crimson and cadmium red. They're the two reds I bought and I got this beautiful colour. And in here is the first pure colour. And all I've done is add water to that red to make these beautiful pinks. So they all stem from... Um, I think I've got it handy from that. Again, the greens. The pea greens are obviously the Silelium blue and the lemon yellow. But these darker greens are made by the um, the warmer blue, which is French ultramarine, and a cad yellow. That's going to give you all the olives because there's red in there. There's red in the blue to make it a warm blue. And there's red in the in the green because it's a cad yellow and the cad yellow is warmed up by a touch of, of red so you've got red in two of those colors the tertiary colors and that makes the olive color in there so you know if you've got a green and you have a touch of red to it you're going to get a darker tone but you need to mix orange with it to get a proper color did that make sense <laughs> did that make any sense Oh, hi, Suzanne. Welcome to Bunny's Designs. So, that's made from six colours. So, we'll pop that away. So, we go back to here, and it tells you about mixing the secondary triad. So, this is the primary triad, which is the, the printer ink colours, the cold yellow, the cold blue, and the warm pinky red. The secondary triad colours are the colours that ne are needed because it shows you here. 
if you try to make a green you will get a duller green a dull purple now the orange is fine because you've got the two bright colors so you get an orange so what we have to do is we have to have some co-triad colors so that means we need two reds um, so it says here you work in primary triad consisting of six colors rather than three colors with two versions of each primary who they call these colors co-primaries. So the co-primaries are a crimson red, a scarlet red. So the crimson is the Elysian crimson and the scarlet is the cad. That's what I call them, but different, different um, companies have different names, but you could use a crimson and a scarlet or you could use an Elysian crimson and a cadmium red. You need a golden yellow and a lemon yellow. Well, lemon yellow could be a bright, a bright cold yellow and the golden yellow could be a cadmium ye yellow and it's a bit warmer. And then we have the blues. We have a sky blue, a cerulean blue, or we have um, an ultramarine. They actually call it ultramarine there. And that's the purpley, that's the warm blue. So we've got a cold set and a warm set. And if you have those six colours, there is no colour on the planet you cannot make. And that's why in the front of my little colour book, I've got the two yellows. I've got an, um, a lemon cold yellow. I've got some cad yellow. And there's a cad yellow there. I've got a Lizzie crimson. I've got two cad reds. That's an Lizzie crimson as well. These are the Cotman ones that's left, what was left on the tube I've put on here. And these are cut from pans, from a watercolour set from pans. I have an ultramarine, and because it was an expensive um, senior set, I put the cobalt blue in there as well, but you don't need that. I have the French ultramarine, and I have the Celilium blue, which is the cold blue. The greens were in there, but I like to make my own greens normally. Um, and there's a few browns in there. There's burnt umber and there's raw umber. But the crimson, Elysian crimson, reds are the most important. So there isn't a colour from here I cannot make. And I was going to prove that because I bought the six colours in the um, near colour twos. And I wanted to make every, 100 colours from the Neocolor 2s to match the 100 colours in a, in a set because I can't really justify buying any more paints. So you can make any colour, you only have to buy six. So that means you could buy six of every medium you want and you've got every colour. Um, the, the good sets, you can always tell a good set of paints or pencils if they have cold and warm blue, cold and warm yellow, and cold and warm red. So when we have this here, the, the, the other triangle should go to the warm a bit here, because it's got some orange in it. It should go to the, the darker green there, and it should go to the orangey red, the, the pinky red there, and that should be the next one. Sorry, French ultramarine to um, which will go to the green no sorry it should be just off beg your pardon it should be just off that's the cold and so we've got a warm one a warm cold and the cold red um, and then you can you can make all these six colors once you've got all these colors these primary colors um, you can then talk about the colour wheel and getting the tertiary colours, um, the secondary colours. So the secondary colours are orange, purple and green. So if you look at this colour wheel, you can see it. We've got, and there's some tertiaries in there as well. So if I just find a pencil... 
so I can make a mark on here. So that is the lemon yellow, the cold yellow. So that's the primary. Then we have the pink, selenium and um, magenta. So that's the primary. And then the blue, we have the cold blue and that's the primary. So those three colours there, I made all these colours here. But I could not get a lovely purple because I didn't have a warm blue. So the next colour you need is you need the primary blue, or they call that the secondary primary. You need a cadmium yellow or a cold, a warm yellow, which is a, pri a secondary primary. Oopsie, sorry. Um, so that's the secondary primary. That's French ultramarine, and then you need a cadmium red, which is a colder red. So it has a bit of orange in it, and that's a secondary primary. So you've got six colours here that will make every colour on the planet that you want. So from there, we are now going to make our, um, our secondary colours. And so we have an orange, we have a purple, and we have a, a green. And if you notice, that's a bright green, that's a lovely orange, and that's a bright purple. So then we want to mix the purple with a little bit of extra blue, a warm blue next to it, and that's called a tertiary. Again, you will have the, the purple, the original secondary colour, and you have the warm red. And that gives you a ready purple, and that's a tertiary. Here we've got an orange and we add a touch of red to it, so it's now a tertiary colour. It's a reddy orange. It's not a yellowy orange. Because here we've got orange and we add yellow to it and we get another tertiary colour. And then we have a primary yellow with the bright green and we get a pe very pale green and that's a tertiary colour. And then again we have another primary which is a blue with the, with the original green made bright green and then we get a bluey green which is the tertiary and all this is basically is every colour in between is your 72 ink 10 pencil colours or your Caran d'Ache colours and they're all tertiaries because they're all going to be in between all these major colours so you can get um, as I did on the other colour wheel with the colour this is the, how I used it with the printer inks I then took the tertiary purple, the reddy purple, and I added more red, and I got a red red purple. I then took, so that would be a red red purple. I then took the purple and I added some blue to it, and I got a blue blue purple. Sorry, I got a blue purple blue. Um, here, there's a purple. So I got a purple, purple blue, because it's more purple than it is blue. Did that make sense? Did that make any sense? And you just can keep going and going. So again, here we've got a tersey green, but we've got the blue. So if we put this, this is going to be a blue, but it, then it's going to be a blue green. If we took these two colours it would be green but then it would be a blue green so that's got more blue in it and that's got more green in it so that would be a green blue green and as I said there is there is um, a video of me making all these colours from printer inks the difficulty was the warm purples every other colour reacted perfectly with the three printer inks um, and as a tight Yorkshire lass, I used three printer inks. I think it was three pounds from Wilco's. And I practiced my colouring, my colour mixing with printer inks. And I got 630 some, I think. Um, the only difficulty was this purple. I could not get my, my French ultramarine. That's the only one I couldn't get because I managed to get a lovely cad red and I managed to get a lovely... Um, 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 
I got a cad yellow perfectly and I got a cad red. I could not get the French ultramarine. And this French ultramarine is going to give you all these colours. And without it, you're going to have dull colours, which are lovely. You know, they are nice, but they're dull. They're not that lovely, beautiful colour. So that's your colour wheel. And by adding water or white, depending on... If it's watercolour, you add water. If it's acrylics, inks, you add the white. And that will give you the grayscale. You can also do that by adding the complementary colour. And that's how I did it on the video. I added orange to blue. I added yellow to purple. And I added orange to... Um, sorry, red to green. And that dulls down and gives you some gorgeous greys. Um, just by adding the complementary colour. So we ne I never use black. Now if you mix these three colours together, or any combination, you will get black in the middle. Or you get a very dark colour. And again, sometimes a ready black is a lovely warm shadow. A bluey black is a very cold shadow. So again, we've got warms and colds. If we just do that there... This is the cold side and this is the warm side. So if you were doing a, sun, a sunny colour and you wanted a warm sh high, uh, shadow, you would use one of these with the complementary colour to get a warm black. If you were using a cold one, cold colour, and you wanted a shadow like a sea cut, sometimes boats and sea colours have dark shadows, that's going to be cold. So if your principal colour is, is cold, you want to add its complementary colour and to make a grey scale to black. And your blacks will be a cold black, but they'll never be black black. I, I hardly ever use white or black because I can make some gorgeous greys and blacks myself. But if you want a really quick black grey and you can't be bothered, you want a French ultramarine and a burnt umber and make a brown and that will give you Payne's grey. Does that make any sense? <laughs> so I say pop that into... Uh... Does that make any sense? Oh hi LeBookworm, welcome to Bunny's Nine, welcome Christy. I've got to squint because I'm on a really small screen <laughs> but I don't have the fan noise. So the best thing to do if you want to have a look at the colour wheel and colour mixing is to have a look at that really long video mixing, I think I called it colour mixing with printer inks. And that can basically give you all the colours. The problem is the warm purple. Um, so it then goes into hues and it says we refer to a colour by its name. We are referring to it, its hue. So if you hear the word hue, that's the colour. So we've got here, we've got the scarlet red, the cold red. We've got um, the golden yellow, which I would call cadmium yellow. The lemon yellow, which is a zinc yellow, very cold. We've got then the middle colour, which is a green. We've got a sky blue, which is the cyan, cerulean. French ultramarine, which is Cobalt blue is about here, so cobalt blue isn't still a good colour because you can't get that beautiful purple because you don't have French ultramarine. Elysian crimson is the very, very warm pink um, called Cy um, um, magenta. That's your printer inks. So those three on the top are your printer inks. But it's better to have the others as well. Did that make any sense? So it's very good to make a colour wheel of your own. I've got to be a bit careful because there's a couple of, of uh, nude paintings in here. So this is a good book because it talks about uh, how your eye reacts to colour and why artists use different colours. Um, and it goes through all the kind of putting colours next to each other. But I don't think that's too important here. Um, when it becomes important is in the next little book here. 
So this is drawing index, and I think they got to be a pound in the in the works. So I'll just zoom out a little bit now because I'm in the wrong place. So I like this little book. It's materials, techniques, and theory. And I bought one of each for my daughter, so they're a bit uh, they have actually looked through them. So it tells you about um, it's actually how to use the book. Uh, it tells you about materials. It talks about graphite pencils. It talks about graphite sticks and powder. And charcoal would be in there somewhere. Coloured pencils. It says the coloured pencils are bound with a wax. And the softness varies slightly. Talk about water, water soluble pencils and, and how to use them and what they are. Charcoal sticks, I'm oh, sorry, just going to charcoal, and what it's made of and, and how it's formed. Charcoal pencils. Uh, the Conti sticks and pencils, these are the, the gorgeous drawing, I think they're French. Um, different ways of blending and how to use them soft pastels now this is what I was using they're very very soft but you need to use them on a paper that has a key and it's got fixatives there and hard pastels there's water resist, resist and they look like um, Crayola crayons but the hard pastels are actually a watercolor as well so it says these vibrant sticks of colour are made from ground pigment bound with a little gum. That's what I said. They are round in selection and vary in size. So these are the really softy chalky ones that I was using. And so there's quite a lot of dust with them. And they're normally made of almost pure pigment. With just a little bit of, of binder. And so they go left to dry into a, into a stick. Um, the next ones are the hard pastels and they're really good but they just have a little bit more binder and a little bit less pigment that's why these are cheaper the other one is pure pigment this is a little bit less it's still chalky and I actually quite like working with these because they're not as soft so you, you don't waste as much um, but again you know if you took a paintbrush to this a damp brush you could you could fix this there because they're basically a pigment the crayons have been, um, it doesn't say what they've actually been mixed with, but it's, it's obviously a wax because they are not water soluble. Um, it goes into ink pens and different inks and these are the rotary ones, the bamboo pens. So it's quite a good little, little book and the waterproof inks and we've got water soluble ink. I told you about those ballpoint pens. It's a real good little book. It's called The Drawing Index, David Webb, uh, Materials, Techniques and Theories. It's drawing, The Drawing Index. And it's right by D and C, which is David and Charles. that it does show you an awful lot about what things are and what they're made of so there's fiber tip pens brush pens oil pastels the pigment in oil pastel sticks is combined with an oil instead of a gum so that's why these are not water soluble oil painting sticks uh, again, these are moulded into sticks. So these again are more expensive because they have, um, I think they have more pigment in them. So that's why the, the art bars from, from Derwent are a little bit more expensive than some cheaper ones. The same with the Caran d'Ache Neocolor 2s. So there's a lot of colour in those, a lot of pigment, so they're a little bit more expensive. It goes into erasers and I actually draw with erasers as well. So there's a pencil form. That would be quite good for your pastel pencils. I just can't find mine at the moment. 
talk to you about fixatives, colourless fixatives. Um, now, as a student, I've always used, and I still got my paintings when I was 16. In fact, no, when I was, yeah, when I was 15. Uh, and we used hairspray. But we used to be as high as kites after our life drawings. Um, painting with um, charcoal <laughs> all day with rooms where the three ladies, I think they all smoked. We could smoke and we were in, a, in a, there were five fires on to keep the ladies warm in a huge room. Uh, and then we did the best thing on the planet. We used fixative. <laughs> to fix. So every 20, 18 students were then using fixatives all at the same time. So no wonder I've got asthma. <laughs> uh, brushes. Uh, thinners, this is for uh, when you're oil painting, um, the sand oil, there's, there's a lot of low low things now, so I, I've got my other ones, but I don't think I can use them. It talks about easels and positions, so if you're going to use watercolour, you don't want to be on a tilt unless you want it to run, you've got to be flat, but easels are quite good. Then it goes into storing soft pastels. It's always good to leave them in their original thing. It's the only one I do leave. But if they get dirty, you put them in rice. And I've seen a, a proper pastelists with dishes with rice. And they just throw the same colours in that rice. So all the greens would be together and all the oranges and all the reds. So, because they do literally just fall apart. And then it talks about stumps, sharpers, shapers and blenders. So again, this is a torsion. Um, I had one here. Uh, and I didn't realise that was the right word. Well, I thought it was the right word, but again, no, I get a bit. So a paper blender. They call them all sorts, but they call them stumps. We used to call them torsions, and it actually calls them that in something. Or other. Oopsie. So they're very good, but they're very hard. So I have difficulty using them because the, the blenders are basically like an eraser. They're very squishy and soft. So when I'm doing this, it's not putting any pressure on my hand. Whereas when I'm using a torsion, it is. The shaper, that's what I've got, is a shaper. It does the same thing. There's a blending pencil. Now, I was going to get some of these, but I'm not going to do it because I would not be able to use them. Then there's burnishing, which is uh, burnishing and blenders are pencils that are designed for use with coloured pencils to, sh to add shine to the colour. Now, if you look on the Derwent website, there is a video of the lady using these. She uses the colour soft and then she burnishes them and it makes a sheen. It's very clever. Then there's sharpening and knife, scalpel blades, craft knife. knife. Um, this would probably be the better one. You've got a sharp blade but it retracts. Extenders and holders. So if you didn't want to get your fingers, I've got three of those. I've never used them. Um, I know I bought one for charcoal, so you can put charcoal in here and you just kind of, oh that's actually got one in, that's got like a graphite pencil in and then that's for charcoal, it's double ended, I don't know where I got that one from. So these are to hold your charcoals, your chalks, your pastels, anything you don't get your hands dirty, but you still want to use them. Then there's the resists, there's the masking fluids, the candle wax, um, so you can do your wax resists. Then it talks about paper and bristol boards, art boards, uh, water paper um, and this is a cold pressed, expensive cold pressed paper, rough watercolour papers with the ridges, so you can use these and it tells you you can use them for watercolours but you could also use these for pastels then there's pastel paper so it's got a really good um it says paper paper for pastels can be bought in single sheets or pads in a range of about 14 colours the colour of the paper shows through the pastel line it gives them a warm or cool value tone the choice of colour to suit the subject matter is an important consideration there are two specialised papers for pastels. There's the Mytic 
uh, tinnits our tints paper pastels and the ingress so uh, the my teen tints I can't pronounce that I do apologize pastel paper idea for pastel chalk uh, sanguine and oil pastels as well as pencil the ingress paper has a textured surface made up of fine parallel lines and is sometimes has a slight fleck used for pastels oil pastels and conti pencils um, so it, it's quite good in talking about different things what does ISBN mean I'm a bit stupid today <laughs> I'll just explain to Suzanne, I've got my thick head on today. So this is about coloured pa colored paper and the different weights, textured sand paper, and then it talks about other papers and handmade papers, sketchbooks, and then it talks about paper weights. And paper weights is important because, you know, if you put a watercolour on certain things, other things happen. So then it goes into techniques. So it tells you how to use your graphite pencils and what to use them for. So it's a really good little book is this graphite sticks. So you can get some nice texture on there. Um, graphite sticks again and then powder. So you can smudge it in with your fingers. Or alternative use a stiff brush or a torsion, which is the blending pens, uh, the blending paper, and then fixing graphite powder, creating and erasing fixes, and drawing with an eraser, which is what I used to do. This is a fairly new book, actually. We didn't have this around. We were taught this. It goes into coloured pencils, what you can do with them, and different marks you can make. Oh, right, it's on the back of the book. Is that the long number? Let me see if I can just pop that on there. So that's the long number of the book. But it does say Dave and Charles, UK fourteen ninety nine. But I think I found them in the pound in the works for a pound. Um, and it's a it's a stocking filler. I bought them for the girls a long time ago, and it keep having a play. In fact, I might actually send this back to my daughter at uni <laughs> to give her some idea of what she's doing. Was that okay? Oopsie! Don't know why I can't get into that. Yeah, it's the barcode. So that says it's a 9780715326534 in my best telephone voice. <laughs> so you've got the coloured pencils and again it shows you a little bit about colour and what's happening. Coloured pencils and different ways of using them. Water soluble pencils. It does actually say about you about using them wet but I would be very careful because you can damage it but again you know using it wet it's darker here wet lead used to bold colors uh, I would use the brush on the tip of the color rather than dipping the pen in but that's the difference and that's very much like the ink tense difference so the ink tense pencil and the the watercolor pencil it reminds me of the uh, The other page I did in here, I think it was in this one, was it? So we've got ink tense pencils, just scra just scratched a few colours. But you can use more than three or four colours and you can't do that normally in watercolours. So we've got the ink tense pencils on this side and the Derwent watercolour pencils on that side. Um, and I use them in about the same way, I picked about the same colours for the fronds of the, the pineapple. Um, 
so that reminded me of, of, of that particular page well thank you Suzanne does it say how many uh, Suzanne's put it on Amazon drawing handbook David Webb does it say how much it is now <laughs> Oh, it says they have used for a penny or new for one ninety five. Yep, that's good. I, I did see them at let's say the works. I bought two as stocking fillers. So then we have water soluble coloured pencils. Again it shows you what I do. Never looked at this book before. <laughs> I bought them for the girls and then when they were kicking out all the their colour books, I, I got everything. So I've got two of these. Water soluble pencils. Again, it shows you what you can do with them, overlaying colours. Then it goes back into the charcoal sticks. And you can actually add water to charcoal st 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 sticks because that's what I do in my little book here. These are the Derwent Graffitones, um, which is basically a soft waterable pencil. Oops, I can't find it. It's in here somewhere in my little book. there and that's basically some pastel pencils that are almost like graphite pencils but they're they're water soluble and these would be as well you can blend with either a blending tool a torsion or with a paintbrush charcoal sticks and pencils techniques the conti sticks and pens and pencils that's quite nice because that's going to give you some linear marks and tones the conti sticks and pastels using coloured paper. So again, you, the background makes all the difference. The conti sticks are the te textured. They're almost a combination of a pastel, but they've got a little bit more about them, so they're not quite as soft. And then we've got pastel pencils and chalks. Pastel pencils and chalks again so you can see just how lo how lovely they are and it goes into soft pastels making marks um, using some cloudscapes using them on fine sandpaper and vela paper a very different traditional pa pastel papers soft pastels again and blending and mark making um, this is a real good little book to start with and to play. You've always got to play with your new art supplies before you apply them to anything. Um, I've used most of them for a long time, so I'm okay. But I never played with the pastel pencils before, only till the other day when I was forced to do so. Again, scrumbling. A bright coloured pastel lends itself to, to the technique of scrumbling. Using the side of the pastel, lightly drag it over the first layer of colour. The broken effect is very textural. A darker green indicates the shadow areas. A downward stroke of the side of the pastel stick used, and as the stick is lifted, it creates a broken edge, reminiscent of individual leaves. It's very clever and very loose as well. Basic mark making with hard pastels. You can see that. Let's see. You might not be able to see that particular page because it's on a very dark page. I mean, I, I was just looking for my colour books and I found this, and then when I was going, just flicking at the back, I thought, actually, this is such a good book. I only need this book, really. Um, again, hard pastels, hatching and cross-hatching. So you can do all these with, with basically um, as a graphitone with charcoal and pencil. Uh, and with colour, you can make some gorgeous things. As a general rule, you work from dark to light. So it's opposite of watercolour pencils. Hard pastel, scrumbling and, gra and, and graffito. That's basically a, t a technique called scraffito involves the use of a craft knife or a scalpel to, to scratch into the surface colour to reveal a second colour underneath. There's crayons, 
Uh, most crayons have a limited colour range. Well, they ha they don't now. I mean, this was made a little while ago. An optical colour mixing effect can be created by crossing, hatching and hatching. Well, it was a guy called Cross and also um, Surat who did the dots. And they put colours together to make other colours. And, we, and you optically mix them in your head. And there's the famous one of the, the boat scene. Um, I don't think I have it on me. And again, that's so when you mix when you mix colours together and really close together, you you see a green. Um, but Surat was the expert, and they, I think we called dot things, or I can't remember what they called it now. It doesn't actually mention Surat. Uh, crayons blending um, and sgraffito, which um, that's the scratching on there. Ink pens, ink pens, waterproof inks, ink pens um, with water soluble inks, ink pens, acrylic ink, drawing and marks. So again, you can get some lovely images on there. Uh, it shows you how to cut a quill to make um, to make your own drawing implements. It goes to ballpoint pen. Now this is how I taught my children. I taught my children with a pencil when they were little. And then I said, right, there's a biro, black biros. And the, the best one is the Vic one. Um, and they that's why they look at something for a long time before they make marks. And I love biro painting, uh, drawing with biros. And they're cheap and cheerful as well. And you've got to be braver, you know, you've got to think about what you're doing because that marks down there. So then we've got fibre tipped and marker pens, fibre tipped and marker pens again. Experiment with different manufacturers of the same of the same drawing. Um, work quickly, resting the tip of the the tip, the pen tip on the paper will leave a blotch which may spread. So you so you've got you've got if you want blotches and drops and drips so you want to be fast uh, brush marker brush pens uh, linear marks and one or two colors again it's going back to cross hatching and and drawing and marks with brush pens and then it goes into oil pastels now this is what i was trying to use the other day but i found them a bit difficult because you've got to kind of a bit like a crayon you've got to have a little bit of a push down and I, I can't do that uh, not too much but, um, not too much but they're vivid and bright colors ideal for drawing they are not as crumbly and soft as, as soft pastels or hard pastels they work on almost any support from paper to card so they're quite good um, tone and scrumbling scratching the surfaces and mixing um, oil pastels and blending, so you can put your two colours together and then blend. Oil pastels and layering. It's a good little book, isn't it? And this is oil pastel sticks, and you get some really kind of tonal effects. Blue and red are blended with the finger to create a rich purple for the cherries. Impasto, that's very thick. They're oil pasta, they're just really, really um, thick. It can be expressive to a painting. Impasto. Um, scraffiti, scraffito, that's where you, you put lots of colours down and then you scratch over the top. Um, very similar to the children's one where they have the colour and then they put black crayon over the top. And then they scratch and they have a coloured image underneath. It's very similar, but you're not blacking out the rest of the colour. You're adding another colour on top. Um, I can't think what they call that other thing. When the children do it when they when they scratch the black from the top. I can't think what they call it. So this is combining and mixing media. Explore the creative possibilities beyond one medium and by encourage encouraged to look at your work and style in its new light. Use this section as an 
an aid to expression and skill development and to look at the myriad possibilities of mixed media which all have been selected because of their compatibility. So then it goes into um, I'm not boring everybody to tears. <laughs> so it goes into graphite, coloured and watercolour pencil. So it says graphite pencils are commonly used in the initial sketch, which is then worked up in another medium. Take care when using them with, with coloured or watercolour pencils, as the graphite lines can show through, and I thought they'd actually, they would actually... Um, They would also um, blend as well and bleed through. But it says, uh, minimise this by raising the lines gently to lighten the drawing. So you do the drawing and then you take your pencil and you just kind of rub off gently. So you've just got an image. And then you colour it in with watercolour and you won't be able to see your dark lines. Graphite pencil, soft pastel and charcoal. It tells you how to do everything and how to build it up. So it's a good little book, is this? Graphite sticks, coloured and water soluble pencil. Graphite stick and Conti past soft pastels. Graphite sticks and hard pastels. Graphite powder, Conti past Conti and soft pastels. So you've got your graphite powder for smudge your background to give you that gorgeous effect. And then the Conti um, for the outline drawing. And then I think you'd use, yes, finish with Mr. Dark. So wait a minute. The racing car initial outline was sketched in the Conti pencils and developed with soft pastels. Yeah, it says at the end it will need fixing. So if you've used a sprinkle of graphite powder and smudged it with your finger for a background, then the Conti colours, um, and then you need to, uh, and soft pastels for colour. It needs fixing. Coloured pencils, soft pastels and charcoal. Again, it shows you how to do that and the different images. Let's see if I can actually... <laughs> Suzanne says she's ordered it. I feel guilty now. <laughs> Everybody will be spending pennies. But if it's, if it's a couple of pounds, it's worth it. It's one of the really expensive things. That's better a better view. Coloured pencils, hard pa pastels and ballpoint pen. Watercolour pa watercolor pencils, soft pastels and charcoal. You can see the charcoal on the edges there. Um, watercolour pencils, waterproof ink and boil point and fibre tip pens. So there's all sorts of combinations. Charcoal sticks, pencils, graphite sticks and coloured pencils, soft pastels. So it depends what kind of image you want to do. Um, so it gives you all these different variations and tells you how what to use. Soft pastels with watercolour pencils and soft pastels with charcoal and hard pastels. So you will get some lovely expressive marks with pastels. It's just if you have asthma, you're going to have to work outside in the summer. <laughs> um, so it does mix quite a lot of things together for mixed media. Pen and wash. Waterproof inks and water soluble pencils, that's what I use a lot. And then you've got charcoal to give um, the graded effect. Water soluble inks and graphite pencil for black and white images. So it's a monochrome graphite pencil sketch has been crisped up with the touches of a ballpoint pen. So they've done an initial graphite pencil sketch and scratched it in. And then they've just gone around the edges with a ballpoint pen and then 
the stronger lines they've used um, pastels for colour. It is a very very good book this I have to say. Um, I had a flick through as I say when I was um, the girls have had these years uh, and I'd forgotten all about it until uh, there's just two on the shelf there and I thought I'll just have a quick flick of what it said about pastel pencils and then I was quite impressed. So this is basic theory. Drawing is a skill but it can be learnt through practice. This chapter encompasses colour theory and, and context as well as exploring form, percep perception and shape. Build up your knowledge of basic rules and use these methods to lay firm foundations to overcome the challenges you must learn to face in your work. So again, it talks about colour theory. Um, exploring colour theory is a great way to start experimenting with colour mixes. Learn about primary, secondary and tertiary colours can seem abstract and theoretical, but they will give you notice of the they will make you notice the colours around you in nature or man-made objects and replicate them in your work. So again, we've got the primaries um, and we've got the reds, yellows and blues from which it's possible to mix all other colours of the spectrum. But we know we just need two of each. Two reds, two yellows and two blues. The warms are the reds, the oranges and the yellows in Arab perspective, warm colours are said to come towards you. So then we've got the secondary colours. They obtain by mixing equal amounts of the two primaries. And you get coals. So you've got blues, greens and purples. In Arab perspective, cool colours are said to appear more distant. So if you were doing, and it actually shows you in here as well, all about that. So I'll come to that later. But it tells you all about optical mixing, transparencies, glazing and scrumbling. Um, neutral colours, shades, tones, hues, tints, transparency, uh, tertiary colours, browns and greys containing all three primaries and tones. So it's really, really good. It does go into a lot of detail. And then of course we have the magic colour wheel. And again, different book still works the same. A primary yellow. Um, we have um, primary red and primary blue. Now, if you look at their purple, it's cold. It's not a vivid purple. Because this is a cold blue, this is a primary blue, but it's a selenium blue. It's a selenium, it's a cyan, it's a very cold blue. And you can't get a lovely purple with a cold blue. But that's principally how I did these first colours here. These are all colours made from this colour wheel, which looks like this. Oh, I've gone the wrong way around, but very similar. Um, the greens are very beautiful, the oranges are good, the purple is a bit dark. So this one does not talk about the secondary colours. It says red, yellow, red and blue. So let's see if it talks about, it doesn't talk about the secondary colours. So we need to go back to this book, which is a proper artist and designer's colour theory book. Again, which is why I bought it, which says that you know, that system doesn't work on its own. You know, that colour doesn't work. So sometimes you'll mix the colours together and go, why is that not working? Why is that blue and that red not giving me a really beautiful, bright, vivid purple? And the answer is, it's the wrong blue. Now we can warm that blue up by adding a touch of red to make it a purpley blue, but it's really difficult. And I've tried quite a few times to make a French ultramarine and you need an ultramarine warm purpley blue for a, vi a, a, vi a bright vivid purple. So this book is brilliant but it misses out that bright purple. So 
you could not probably get this color purple by mixing those two colors because it shows here it's a dull purple the secondary violet is between the red and the blue it's the secondary color it's a purple but that's a very dull purple it's not this purple so when they said mix blue and red together to produce purple they're not talking about cerulean blue and and um, and the red because it's the wrong purple it's the wrong blue it's too cold you've got to have a warm blue which is the French ultramarine and as long as you can remember that one it's the only one that doesn't work the rest work because you've got an orange from your red and you've got the cold yellows and the greens it's just that purple that's the bugbear if you only have three colors so but if you have six colors you're fine go back to here and we want you see that's not purple we've got to go back to these six colors a warm and a cold red a warm and a cold yellow a warm and a cold blue and if you look on the outside that's what it's going to give you so you've got a warm purple there but it's a bit colder and duller than this one because this is French ultramarine so it's a different purple you've got a nice orange and you've got a gorgeous green but it's your purple that you need that French ultramarine and it, it is possible to mix it because the printer mixes it it's just it's a difficult one to get so if you have six colors which isn't going to break the bank if you've got six of each color you can make any color on the planet so I disagree with this book a little bit this is perfect but sometimes I want a brighter purple than that Has anybody got any questions did everybody understand that little bit there So we do need, um, if I can see chat, I can't see, I can't see the screen and I'm trying to keep in. Spare me two seconds. It's just about in. So that works perfectly. And then you've got the tertiaries. So you've got the ready purple. But that's not a primary. My primary red would go in there. My, my Salili, um, Elysian Crimson would go in there. Um, that's okay that works well everything works well but the blue again and the it says the tertiary orange yellow well that would be my cad yellow in here and then I would have that one as the cad yellow would be a little bit warmer so I would have um, the cold yellow that primary looks rather warm so here I would have a lemon yellow I would have a lemon yellow the primary yellow is normally a cad yellow uh, or primary and then I would this one would be my yellow my yellow orange yellow and but in here I would have an orange yellow orange so it would be an orange color uh, um, a yellower or, uh, orange that would be a ready orange in there and that's how you get from six colors to a hundred colors um, now I will actually do this when my hands better I'm going to do this with the Caran d'Ache Neo Color 2s because I don't have the full set um, so I intend to make a little square of every colour of my Caran d'Ache Neo Color 2s and I can make some tertiary colours by mixing two together it's not going to be easy but you know, I'm going to have a go I've got to push myself a little bit so the colour theory works at through this perfectly well the secondary colors are the green the orange and the purple but as I say you wouldn't get that purple from cerulean blue a cold blue you that purple is made from a warm blue but again the cold blues are gorgeous the cold purples are gorgeous um, you can use them like I use them here they still work really well there's some really nice cold blue colors in here. I just do not have a vivid purple. 
Um, whereas, because I worked with six colours here, you know, I could have any colour I wanted. I don't think I actually made a purple. Oh, I did make a purple. Purpley blue is there, look. So I got some bright purpley blues. It's probably French ultramarine. Um, and the butterfly. But I couldn't have had that colour with a, with the three limited palette. So you do need that warm French ultramarine. And again, complementary colours. So we've got red and green, orange and blue, and yellow and purple. And I use these a lot when I did the colouring for the uh, Christmas baubles in Joanna's Christmas book. And that's why a lot of them work quite well, because I use the complementary colours quite a lot. Then there's the hot and cold colours. And then it calls it wet colours, mixing wet colours together. Mixing dry colours together. Uh, and then mixing dry um, pastels, hard pastels, oil pastels. So it's, if you could go work your way through this book, it would be really good. Uh, broken glazes and colour mixing, optical colour mixing. Again, I talked about a gentleman called um, a gentleman called Cross actually in Paris. Uh, Cross did when we went to the Paris um, one of the one of the places, the one with the the glass dome uh, triangle. Uh, I can't think of his name. It oh, might be a bar bark alert. This is the postman. Um, and Surat. He used dots, so when you stand away from his thing, you see colours, but when you walk slowly, they're all dots. So he's got blue and yellow dots together, and when you're apart, it looks like it's green, because you optically mix things. Oh, the optical colour mixing, there we go. Tonal values, and you find that better with... Um, the best way i found to find if your colour mixing works is to take a black and white copy of it and if it still looks good as a black and white copy you know your tonal advantage is worth that's that's how i do it um, you take a black and white photograph or um, black and white print it in black and white that's what i'm trying to say instead of color and then it'll show you if it's right because if it looks right in black and white your tones are right that's the easiest and quickest way to double check um, aerial recession. This is talking about the cold, the cold in the distance, and the warm in the in the foreground, and that automatically puts it in the back. Even though they're brighter colours, it automatically puts it behind. Uh, it talks about vanishing points. This is making your eye go in a certain position. Giotto was good at this. Giotto was the first guy to do it. Oh, Giotto, and he did biblical scenes and he had arches and your eyes were all if you with a pencil drew all on top of all his paintings his vanishing points went through arches uh, so I don't know if I can get to that before. so that's good because it makes your eye you, you're making the viewer look where you want not where they want um, so it talks about vanishing points and having more than one vanishing point so you could have a, a tree there and that would be on a road so you you would start here and then your eye would go off um, and again linear recessions it doesn't look um, like a vanishing point but your bigger clouds are becoming condensed so the perspective wise it's making you look to the horizon overlapping forms so although this is a warm color you're looking through and you still want to see this because this is colors from the foreground uh, the third the rule of the thirds is good as well you know if you look at that one it's okay if you look at that one it's interesting so you don't have them all in the same line as a cross you've got three so you've got this bit, your horizon's on the third line there, and your 
flowers are set to one side. And that's often what you see in a lot of professional uh, watercolorists and, and, and artists. They're offset, they're never in the middle. Because if they're in the middle, it doesn't have the same pleasing effect. You see, the main focus is, is this tree, but it's not in the middle. It's to the side. So you look at this and then you sweep round. Otherwise you'd look at it in the middle and then you'd go away and you'd miss everything else round. And then it says about shapes and opposing shapes and negative space. When we were taught, when you taught to do um, life drawing, you look at a leg or the curve of a breast or the elbow, at the inside of the elbow, and you don't look at the thickness of the arm, you look at the, the, the negative space between the arm, and that's how you get that lovely curve of an elbow. Um, and it's very much like this. You're actually looking at a negative space as well as what you're actually drawing. Uh, and then focal points and more than one focal point. So it's a really good little bo book. Creating form and then creating volume. So I didn't realise how good a little book it was. I must have done when I bought it for the girls because it's, it's simple for them to, to, to think about. But they've obviously had a bit of a play. And then lighting, it talks about light, which again is really important. And if you put this in, even in your colour books, your colour books are going to look pretty special, even though it's just colouring in, when people think it's childish. But you put your lights and darks and shades in, like I did with the little... Um, I did that with the little... Can find it? the daydreams book every time I made a mark with the pencil sorry I know it's going to be rather noisy and I apologize every time I did these I thought about the light so I went round and I left the bit that I wanted to hit with the light so even though that's just a little bit of scribbled pastel onto a page it's a little bit more interesting, the same with the mouth, because I thought about the light. And I did that with the bunnies as well here, with the watercolours. You know, there's a little bit of shade under here. All the light was coming down this way. And so the toadstools were, the bunnies had the light on them. So it always hit the bottoms and the bunny tails and the tops of their ears and the tops of the paws. If the light was underneath and they were running, jumping over a light, then it would be the opposite. The top of the backs would always be dark and the, the tummies would always be light. And that just makes that little bit of difference in your colour books. It, takes, it, it makes just colouring in into its proper own piece of art, I think. And then we've got formats. Again, things going off, things in the middle round shapes, long shapes, um, landscape, portrait. Again, that's very different. It, it's very, it alters. You wouldn't believe how much that alters a composition just by getting the wrong shape. Um, and I think that's all. But that is a real fab little book because you've got the basics in here. And then you can actually, if you work your way through this, uh, you know, even if you've got a, a couple of colours of inks and a couple of everything, or even pick, pick your favourite one, you might think, oh, well, charcoal, never touch that with a barge pole. Then don't go there, use something else. Pick out. I would think there's probably everything in here. Apart from oil paintings, um, there's no oil paintings, there's no watercolours. I don't think there's any watercolours. There might be, I can't remember now. There's, we have watercolours. I think there maybe was a bit about watercolours, wasn't there? Because they wouldn't miss those out. I don't, th I don't think it mentions acrylics though. Let me have a look. I didn't think it mentioned acrylics. Oh, acrylic inks, acrylic paints, 199. Yes, it did, 199. Let's have a quick look here. 
Ah. Oh. Oh, that's acrylic paint. So that's oil stick and that's acrylic paint. Acrylic paint can also be used for impasto. So it's a little mention of how to use acrylics. So um, I hope you found that interesting. Um, this is another, I say this is probably for somebody who's studying art and watercolours and it talks about interacting. I've got to be a bit careful because there's a nude in here somewhere. Um, but it talks about real real in-depth about colour theory which we don't need to know we need to know how to mix nice colours and what colours go next to each other when we're doing our colour book that's all we really need to know we don't need to know the ins and outs and why psychologically it affects us and all that unless you're a graphic designer or an artist um, but for colour for colouring a colour book um, that this is the basics to, to, to end up with a decent drawing or a decent colour there's, there's all the techniques in there and all, all about which, which pastel. So I shouldn't be using my pastels in my colour book. Um, but it was an experiment. Um, as I said, it could all drop off. It could wipe off. Pastel, oil pastels do that. So I hope you found that interesting. And I'm going to, just going to start making myself a coffee. Uh, so thank you for watching. And that's about... Um, some basics, materials, techniques and theory. Thanks for watching.